Hi, my name is Benita Martinez. I have four children. I am an owner, very proud owner of Habitat for Humanity House. My Habitat for Humanity house means to me, my life. When I went to apply at Habitat for Humanity, I never thought that I could qualify for a house. I didn't have uh, an education. I didn't even have a checking account. I worked and I managed my income with cash. I mean, I remember putting money in envelopes and just saving it for my next bill. The process of the Habitat application allowed me to see that I could be doing something. I want my children to grow up thinking that way. Now that they're grown up, they do. They have those choices, and that's one of the things that I got, stability and choice. Now I can say that I have an education, not only a BA in education, but also a master's in education. Thank you, Austin Habitat for Humanity, for all your assistance and help, and thank you for believing in me, and thank you for guiding me into this new path in my life. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Heather Laddidge, Market President and Publisher at the Austin Business Journal and a proud board member of Austin Habitat for Humanity. I'm gonna be moderating our program today on Austin Habitat's affordable housing community conversation. Um, this is also a women empowerment virtual happy hour. So I encourage you to grab a glass of wine if you can. It is the end of the day, right? And I bet we could all use one. <laughs> Uh, you know, now's the time when people are listening more, trying to understand injustice and its root causes, and looking for way, more ways to impact the many issues that are facing us as a community and, quite frankly, as a nation. The need to shelter in place has given a new meaning to our mission at Austin Habitat for Humanity. And we believe it's the right time to convene folks together and have a community dialogue focused on the gravity of the affordable housing crisis in Austin, which quite frankly is only getting worse. It's really important that we come together to build homes, community and hope in the community. And this is really a moment where we're all being forced to fundamentally look at what home means to us and what it means to have a safe, decent shelter for everyone living in Central Texas. So this afternoon, I am thrilled to be collaborating with these women, um, some legendary female leaders in Central Texas that have been partnering with Austin for um, Habitat for Humanity and community organizations around this very important topic. So I'd like to welcome them. Um, first up, we have philanthropist, designer, and CEO, Kendra Scott with Kendra Scott. Um, I'm so grateful that you could join us today, Kendra, and you really need little introduction. I've been super um, excited watching you on Shark Tank lately during this pandemic. Um, and I also wanted to let everyone know today that if you're tuning in, that you can shop actually at Kendra Scott. Dot com. We hope that you do that after the program, um, not during, but after. You're welcome to uh, jump on there and also at the South Congress location through tomorrow at midnight. And if you use this code, give back 8694, that's give back 8694, 20% of your purchase is going to be donated back to Austin Habitat for Humanity. So um, I really encourage you to do that. You know, it's time to start Christmas shopping, right? I also wanted to uh, point out my um, my little beautiful. Sure this is a, yeah, this is a little key. Uh, do you still sell this, Kendra? Yeah, and they're for habit. They, so yeah, we give back to Habitat for Humanity, and the key is the perfect thing. It's the key to the home and key to the heart, right? Yeah, yeah, I love mine. Um, so welcome, Kendra. Uh, we also have Nikki Graham. She is market president of Austin with Bank of America. Um, Bank of America is our sponsor today of this important discussion, and I wanted to thank Nikki personally for her generous investment with Austin Habitat for Humanity over the years, and also for being my co-chair of the Women's Build. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks, Heather. Yeah. Um, so thanks, Nikki. And then finally, we have Kagan Warren Clem. She's an attorney and professor with the University of Texas Law School and Macomb School of Business and Texas Legal Service Center. 
you got a long title. Um, and that's in the medical legal partnerships uh, section as well. And Keegan is a strong community leader that's working in the trenches, really working in the trenches to help women um, and addressing our community challenges at a grassroots level. So welcome ladies. I wish we could be in a room together today, but for now here we are virtually. Um, you know, this panel is gonna focus on how affordable homeownership empowers women and financial stability, which is a domino effect um, to generations of success and how it affects our community and why we all really need to care about this and why, why it matters. So all of you are clearly um, part of this conversation based on what you've been doing in the community. Um, I'm gonna throw some statistics in here as I ask some questions, but I really just want us to have a great conversation today. So, all right, we're gonna dive right in. So, you know, half of Austin Habitat homeowners are single mothers that earn an average, um, earn less than $50,000 a year. We're, we're here calling this a women empowerment discussion with women empowerment leaders. So I'd like to just hear from y'all, what does women empowerment mean to you and why is it important? I'm happy to start. <laughs> Um, obviously, you know, I, I'm, I am a single mom um, and I was a single mom uh, starting my business in the early days and I have three sons. Um, you know, it's so important. I think Austin is such a community that empowers thought leaders, uh, other entrepreneurs, and really also, you know, having women empowering other women uh, is such a, a big thing. I always say when we hold hands, we're so much stronger together. And, you know, I always like to try to think about, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, but clearly having women understand that entrepreneurial mindset where they can start to take control of their dreams and think about where they want to go, the things they want to achieve, the life they want to live, including the safety and protection of owning a home, uh, and then figuring out how to start to the building blocks to get there. And so that really is empowering women to harness uh, their own dreams, right? And then the community of people around them to really support them to achieve those dreams. And what I love about Habitat for Humanity is part of that is that ability when you have shelter, uh, you have a place to, ho a home. And home is such an important thing. It gives you, that is one thing that then they can put aside to start thinking about the other dreams, the other things that they may want to achieve and do. So uh, for me, it's, you know, I just love to see how women are supporting women, men. There's so many men who lift women up every day as well. And I think we just need to continue that. Well, and Kendra, I'll just jump in. And, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. When I think about women's empowerment, um, you know, I, I, what she said is kind of women empowering other women. And, uh, and sometimes women don't even realize the power that they have. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but there are so many obstacles that get in, get in the way of them um, achieving uh, their dream of success. And it's funny, just to, we moved offices, Bank of America moved their offices uh, last year. And as we were going through some old, we found some old marketing materials and it was addressing uh, women who wanted a credit card. And it, re it basically said, you need to bring in like your spouse or your father to help co-sign on this credit card. And, and I passed it around to, to some of the women in the office because it, it wasn't that long ago when you had to have you know, a man to sign on um, any type of borrowing. So, but things have changed obviously, um, but the work that Habitat does um, that helps women, single mothers and women and families achieve that dream of home ownership is just so critical and so important to our community. Yeah, I would I would really second that notion that when we talk about when we talk about families, we are we are talking about women, right? The when when we as a society are failing our families, it's almost always on the backs of women. Um, you know, and and a woman's well-being is not just about her own well-being, although that's certainly critical, but it's also about the well-being of her children, of those of the family. The effect is intergenerational. Um, and I think that in that way, we are multiplying across society and across time um, the, the impact of empowering women. But I also think it's really important, and, and I want to echo something that, that Kendra said, 
you know, when we talk about empowerment, we're not talking about giving power. We're, we're talking about allowing people to access the power that lies within. And I think when you, when you speak of women in particular, that that's, it's a really important distinction. Um, we need to, to help each other harness uh, that which lies within, as opposed to thinking that we're, we're giving each other uh, power that we may, um, may otherwise possess. Being with my business journal mind hat, hat on here as well, I'd love to know how you empower women within your own organizations. I mean, my company is over 95% women. Um, we have, you know, over 2,000 women across the United States uh, that work for Kendra Scott. Um, I started this company as a, as a new mother. And I wanted to be able to be a present mom and also, you know, be able to do something that I love, have a career. And that was a big part for me is like, I wanted to be able to do both. So as a, an entrepreneur, as a leader, could I create a utopia uh, that allowed women to live their best, most happy, healthy lives and achieve those things? It shouldn't have to be one or the other. Um, but if we can create an environment where we're supporting women and men as parents, uh, wherever they are in their life, um, that's what's really important to me. And so, you know, I would bring my babies uh, to work with me and in, in, I had a pack and play and I'd be on the phone with buyers. And if they started crying, I'd hand the baby off to somebody else. And then other women, as we started small, there were seven of us, uh, we brawl brought our, our kiddos to work uh, and we created this family unit uh, where we support each other. And, and it does take a village of, you know, I need to do this today for my son or he's sick um, and, and, and really being supportive of one another. And so today, you know, we have the statistics of these very, a lot of young mothers. We have nursing rooms in our office where we have mother's milk refrigerators that are just for moms. Uh, you know, we're encouraging, you know, children's days where on the days off when they have school, it's bring your kid to work or stay at home and work with them. And we are, you know, we're trying to facilitate an environment that really celebrates the fact that moms and women are the toughest, most amazing, they can balance a million things at once. I want those types of people to work for me. I want those women. And unlike a lot of organizations, I mean, we've hired, I can't tell you how many women I've hired when they were pregnant. And they would say, I would go to other companies and I'd come in with a pregnant belly and they knew I was going to be on maternity leave and they wouldn't hire me. I can't believe that you hired me. And I'm talking a lot of women have started at Kendra Scott pregnant. And it's because I knew they were the right ones for the job. And the, and, the, and I celebrated that they were about to have this baby. And so when you create a culture of inclusion, of kindness and respect, um, and then that respect is showed back and forth. So I think it's, you know, it starts from the top. You have to lead by example. And everyone in my company knows that they always say, are you a CEO or a designer first? And I always say, I'm a mom first. And, um, and we're all really proud of that. And we're not ashamed to to celebrate our being feminine, being women. Um, and we believe that those things are great assets. So for our company, it really is something very special. And then continuing that legacy through the UT Women's Entrepreneur and Leadership Institute to really help young women uh, start to understand what we talked about earlier, that entrepreneurial mindset of taking harness of their dreams and their goals and letting all of these incredible women that I get to work with every day uh, be examples for them. Thank you. What about at Bank of America? Yeah, well, um, at Bank of America, of course, we're led by CEO Brian Moynihan, but he is surrounded, 45% uh, of his senior management team are women. 40% uh, of our top, you know, top three uh, tiers of management are women. Um, so I would consider us to be also a women-led organization. I'm fortunate in Austin to work with a fantastic group of uh, women bankers who've been in the industry for a very long time. Uh, they work with their clients um, every day to help them um, achieve financial success. And we have supported any number of initiatives, including our Global Ambassadors pro Program, which pairs up bankers and women across the globe um, to exactly what uh, Kendra talked about is helping them develop their business plans, 
um, helping them access capital. Uh, we've worked with Tori Birch in, for their capital deployment program with CDF community development financial institutions across the country providing access to capital and we continue to to do that we also just in a, um launched our human capital report which goes into detail all of our initiatives that support women and in there you, one will see that we've achieved 99.9 percent .9 pay equity so i know in a business that where we have 200,000. Um, employees across the globe, um, pay equity is important, and and we achieve that, um, and we're very proud of that. You know, I think that there there are other um, um, initiatives, especially during this time of COVID, that we've been able to to implement, including some flexibility on who takes care of children. Back to what uh, Kendra was saying, we offered a 16 week paid uh, paternity leave. Um, all of these, all of these initiatives, all of these benefits really help women and families, but we also realize that not everyone has access to these type of programs. So it makes it um, all that more important for us to give back to community and, uh, and work with local nonprofits so that we can help others um, gain access to these type of benefits so that they're empowered uh, to be so women are empowered to be successful. That's a great segue, Nikki. Um, I'm going to kind of jump into four different pieces of impact, right? That the affordable housing um, topic kind of affects and, and how it's all tied together. So, community impact, health impact, the impact on safety, and educational impact. Um, so, I'm going to start with community. So, renters are five times more likely to move in a year than homeowners, and 83% of habitat homeowners felt that their children were safer after moving into a habitat home. Many soci sociology studies have found that residential stability strengthens social ties with neighbors. So I wanna jump into the community impact piece. So why is building community together so important, especially right now, as you were alluding to, Nikki? I would say, you know, renting, renting is an important part of affordable housing. Um, in Austin, so it's just it's part of the general affordability plan. So I think it's it's important to realize that 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 renting is is important an important piece. And I think even Terry mentioned this in the last um, um, home builder section or um, home builder panel, and he stated that the cost of land is up seventy percent, and that housing prices in Austin have doubled just over the last few years. So um, it's home prices continue to increase and this continues to, to impact um, uh, the ability for folks to own a home. And of course we just voted for um, Prop A and B in Austin. And so that's gonna increase taxes a little bit more and add um, to the, the cost of a home. So it's really important to have organizations that support affordable housing. And so, and we all know that renting has its challenges and one of the fundamental uh, pieces of the wealth building strategy is home ownership. So it's absolutely a mechanism and then for wealth building. And then addition, additionally, that living in community is a key determinant of health. So relationships with neighbors, um, looking out for each other, having a safe place for children to play, all of those provide that stability and opportunity that even Benita mentioned um, in the video earlier. Um, Bank of America, for example, uh, la just last year invested over um, uh, $4.8 billion in affordable housing across the country. And so the, in many financial institutions um, make investments in affordable housing, but it's, it's that piece of uh, building community and being in community is so important to the families that Habitat supports. Yeah, I think it's also a way to recognize that we're we are we are whole and complex people, right? We're not just a patient. I go see a doctor. I'm not just a, a, a mom or a professor or a lawyer, but I'm I'm all of these things and, and other things as well. And so I think when we talk about building community, we are also talking about unsiloing our efforts. Um, which I think are one of the greatest structural barriers to, to broad social gains um, and uh, to helping 
women and families harness um, the power and the opportunities uh, that lie you know, within the home space. Um, and so for me, building community is as much about those multi-sectoral efforts that help us leverage our individual and our organizational um, expertise in a way that's, that's consistent with our, our lived experiences as whole beings. Um, I think it's a chance to, to, to acknowledge um, and to respect ourselves as, uh, uh, you know, as, as um, complex beings and, and, um, and while also recognizing that that community is, is central to um, both to quality of life and to our overall longevity of life. Just to kind of echo Keegan, I can't agree with you more because I think it's that the quality of life and having stability is such a it's such a big thing. And for a very long time, I rented. Um, I didn't have the ability to access capital to be able to buy a home for me and my boys. Um, and it was something I think for 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 me when that was able to happen, it was such a big moment. And community for me is that you've got. It's, it's connection. And in these neighborhoods that Habitat is creating, there's this incredible connection. Uh, being able to witness families uh, through the women's build and some other things that we've done, I think that's the thing that they've gained the most is that they have neighbors, they have people looking out for them. And for sometimes the first time in their life, uh, they're able to put some roots down. And those roots can not just help their current family, but it can help future generations uh, through education, through mental health and, and mental and health stability. Um, all of those things happen. And it's crazy that something as simple as a home can give you that. Um, but also, it's not just the, the walls, it's those people around you that you start to be able to have connection with. And, you know, for me, this, this Austin community completely embraced me as a young business owner, lifted me up through a lot of times when I didn't know if I would be able to continue to keep my business. And I think that's a special thing about Austin in particular, uh, is that connection of helping each other, helping your neighbor. And when you are able to see these neighborhoods for the Habitat for Humanity, so many of these people are, are going through similar things. And there's an incredible amount of love that you'll see in those communities. And I think um, that's where the biggest uh, piece of this comes in for, for those uh, women, uh, men, children, all of them that are able to, to have access now to a beautiful, stable environment. So I also mentioned safety, that percentage on um, the impact on safety, 83% of habitat homeowners feel that their child, children are safer after moving into a habitat home. That's a really strong statistic. Um, what do you think the challenges are to shelter in place and what we've been experiencing over the past nine months or so without a safe and healthy home? They're, they're kind of endless. If I can <laughs> jump in here, just right. It's, it's, we, we know that some 22 million people have lost their jobs since COVID-19 caused these nation, the you know, shutdown nationwide across all industries. And so we've seen people struggling with basic needs, including housing, or perhaps starting with housing. Um, and, and there's been interesting responses, right? Like last month, the, the Centers for Disease Control, our kind of public health entity at the federal level, um, issued an eviction moratorium, right? I mean, what more powerful statement could there be about the, the importance of housing um, as, a, as a public health mechanism than for the CDC to step in and say, we cannot have people homeless. We, we have to do something, right? But the, you know, and it, I think it also re really reinforces, you know, as we're talking about shelter in places, we're talking about the pandemic, that this isn't just a, a medical thing. This is, this, is, this is about health, this is about whole lives. Um, and that we have this accompanying uh, economic epidemic that's going on as well. And it's interfering with people's ability to access housing. Um, it's interfering with people to have um, the things that they need once they have housing as well, right? So early in the pandemic, um, one of the actions that, that I and my team were able to take uh, was the lead on getting the Public Utility Commission of Texas to issue, uh, to do some work around utility uh, prevention, uh, utility termination prevention. Um, because it is 
um, because you have to not only have a home to be safe and healthy if you're going to shelter in place, but you also have, have to have running water. Um, you also have to have the lights on. Um, and, you know, I think the most interesting thing part about that is that we did this in a way that that not only helped um, homeowners and tenants uh, within their homes, but also preserve the industry. And that often is a piece um, of the puzzle that's left out um, that uh, that we do have an, an economic model that needs to survive as well. And so the, the, the $30 million gain there um, wasn't just about helping individuals, but also about helping all of us as taxpayers, because we all need energy um, and utility providers um, as well. So um, lots, of, lots of challenges around shelter in place that are connected um, to safe and healthy housing. Well, and Keegan, just to add on to that, it, and you probably have some uh, statistics around this, but oftentimes uh, the families that we work with um, will find that there are multiple families living in the same uh, in the same house or the same rental unit. So, uh, which is challenging uh, during normal times, but in the time of COVID, where you're trying to implement um, social distancing, you're trying to school your children at home. Um, there are all these additional um, challenges uh, to, to operating in that type of system. So I know that, that the opportunity to be um, in a home with your family and being able to just have the, some of that stability and control and management, um, being in your own home, I'm, I'm sure is, is, has been incredibly helpful uh, for the families. And then also just that sense of unity and the ability for Habitat, Austin Habitat to connect those families to the resources they might need because they're in that neighborhood and have those support services available. Yeah, I mean, you have to think about, right? The, I mean, you know, I'm a working mother and my situation is drastically different than a mother who is struggling with not, she may not have access to internet in this limited space. She may not have, I mean, she's trying to homeschool. I mean, there's so many things, right, that we're being put on these uh, stay-at-home moms. And a lot of them, that's the whole thing. They need the home part of the stay-at-home mom. And to having that ability to be able to access those things is so important. And, and I think that, you know, this is a very sensitive time for everyone. You see, you know, what, what's happening with me mental health and wellness for both the children and the mothers. And, you know, many of them are facing unemployment uh, in addition to trying to figure out how they're going to keep their children housed. So, you know, programs like Habitat for Humanity are, are more critical than ever uh, before. Um, and this is a time now that if there was ever a time for us to really start to work hard to make sure that we can provide safe, healthy environments for those families, now is the time. Well said. Uh, we brought up health, the health impact here, just it all pretty much, you know, it's, it's just one big circle all tied together, right? Um, but here's a statistic for you. Poor housing conditions contribute to asthma and other physical illnesses. And a report by the Center for Housing Policy states that decent, affordable housing, you know, and this is just the term decent, right? Affordable housing can help children with um, asthma address their health needs. A national survey of Habitat homeowners found that 74% said their family's overall health had improved since moving into their home. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and Keegan, you might be great to talk a bit about this based on your background, but why is it so important to invest in housing programs because of this health component, which exists anyway? I didn't give any statistics about the post-pandemic world. Right. Uh, right, the, the pandemic has shown us so well, much of what we already knew. It's, it's, it's exacerbated existing health disparities. So I think it's, um, you know, the reason that it's, it's not just important, it's critical to invest in things like Habitat for Humanity is, is because of the way we have things structured in the U.S., right? We have our, we have our private sector, we have our governmental, governmental sector, but we also have a third sector that's driven by community-based organizations like Austin Habitat for Humanity. Um, and in that third sector, we see the things that are critical, like affordable housing for familial and for personal stability. Um, people without secure housing are more susceptible to disease. They are more susceptible to illness. And even for conditions like, like breast cancer that, are, uh, that strike um, in, with relative equality across populations, um, what we see is that 
affordable housing is consistent with the ability to have better health outcomes relative to those who have who are housing insecure. Um, you point out that housing has direct health outcomes for children with asthma, um, as well as others with, with um, respiratory disease. Um, and you know, for this reason, those of us in health policy, we actually say that your zip code is more important than your genetic code when it comes to, uh, when it comes to your health. Um, and, and I think that's because, I just think that's because, it is because um, our access to medical care, right, our ability to see our doctors is actually only about 20% of our overall quality of life or longevity of life, like the, 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 the large indicators of, of our health. Um, and instead, it's 80% that are things like affordable housing. Um, that have an impact uh, on our overall health and well be and well-being. When we invest in uh, affordable housing, we have, it, it, we're getting a lot of bang for our buck, and that's really important because um, because our our resources are limited, right? As a society, um, our financial resources are limited, and and um, affordable housing is tied to so many other community determinants of health. Um, in, in ways that are actually exceed, um, as I stated, um, our access to medical care. You know, and I think you, you know, as a, as a, as a, you know, when you're a mom or you're a, a woman and you're facing, you have to think of the things that prioritize first. A lot of times those are food, shelter, clothing. I need my children to be warm. I need them to be safe. I need them to be in a place that they're going to be able to have a, a good meal. And you have to prioritize those things. And so what happens sometimes is if those things aren't being fulfilled, things like a persistent cough or a lump in your breast or other things may be pushed aside because you're focused on these critical things of just survival, right? And I think what's really amazing about organizations like Habitat for Humanity and others is that being able to give them those things so that then they can have the ability to have early detection for breast cancer and be able to take their kid and find out, you know, if he has a more serious illness. Um, you know, it becomes very, when you think about it, very simple when you break it down that way. And and to see the increase of people really find if through preventative health care through you know doing those things when you have the stability of a home, um, and that's just it's an amazing thing because it starts and whether you know I love that saying it all starts at home and a lot of times it does uh, when you have that security um, and and I can understand that because I've met so many mothers and they said well I didn't do this because I was worried about all of these other things. Um, and like you said earlier, uh, moms will think of themselves last in a lot of cases. Uh, you will take the food off your own plate or you'll take your jacket off of your own back uh, for your children. And of course, you're gonna take care of their health before your own. And so I think you know all of those things uh, multiply, right? And it starts, it starts at home. It starts having that stability and safety, security. Uh, and like you said, water, food, Keegan, very, you know, things that you need, right, to be able to then say, okay, now I can be able to do these other things. And having a home is giving me the opportunity to maybe even have employment that I wouldn't have been able to have before, access to health insurance, uh, things that give them um, those, those abilities. So 100%, it's, it's a huge, a huge part of the health and wellness of, of women and their children. And well, Austin Habitat, you know, is also building not just homes, but community. So the community aspect of, you know, having your community that tries to get you, you know, I feel like my, my friends and neighbors, like we try to keep each other on the straight and narrow with our, with our health, with um, many other things as well. Nikki? Yeah, I was just going to jump in because what, what uh, Kendra and Keegan are describing are these social determinants of health, which is, as Keegan mentioned, it's like 80 to 90% of um, you know, of health is non-medical related. So another aspect of these social determinants is transportation. And what I've found in my involvement with Austin Habitat is the team has done such an amazing job, which is not easy in Austin, to try to locate parcels of uh, land where they can build on that are close to uh, job centers. So 
um, they might be near a bus stop, they might be um, near close to close to work, so that 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 transportation time isn't as great for especially for those moms who have to take care of their kids. So I think that that um, focus on transportation has been important to the Austin Habitat team over the years and is just one more of those uh, determinants of health. Um, one of the other kind of quadrants of impact is education. Of course, we that's come up as well. So according to a National Association of Realtors study, homeownership improves the quality of life for the entire family, leading to higher educational achievement by children. The graduation rate for homeowners' children is 19% higher than for renters, and they're twice as likely to acquire some post-secondary education. Dropout and teenage pregnancy rates are lower among children of homeowners as well. You know, before the panel, we saw the video of Benita Martinez, and she was able to qualify for an Austin Habitat for Humanity home, move in with her family, attain her bachelor's degree and her master's degree in education. Um, so. She's just an amazing success story of what we you know, see with our homeowners. So what, um, I guess, what would you say to another community leader about how they could help improve affordable housing to help create more success stories like what we saw with Benita? What would be your advice to other, before I'll I said go, female- go, Just because I, I love, I love, yeah. I love it so much is that, you know, look, start as soon as you can and however you can. Um, I think that that's just an important message. I think so many times and not just community leaders, I think it's anybody who wants to get involved in their community. You don't always have to do it financially. And what I love about Habitat for Humanity is there's so many ways that you can make a difference and a difference in lives like Benita's. Uh, you know, we did, we were involved in the women's build and we had our employees out there hammering and building a house and it was incredible experience. And they were able to then meet this amazing single mom who was able to move into that home. And I got to see firsthand young adults who may not have thought, oh, because I didn't reach this financial place yet. I'm, I'm not able to do those things. And you can. Uh, the restore, I mean, I can't tell you how many things from you know, lamps to wood to windows, you name it, um, that I've been able to, that you think, oh, that's trash. And they always say that someone else's treasure uh, is truly true. And I think it's just, you know, for leaders to, you know, we give 16 hours of paid philanthropy days at Kendra Scott. Uh, we also encourage our community, you know, our teams to work together to do community things. And so many of them have loved to participate in Habitat for Humanity. And we went out and did that. I had my, you know, one of my sons with me building. And then he started a whole project with another student to build uh, children's little playhouses for Habitat for Humanity because you have to be 18 to do that. So we wanted to figure out a way to get younger children involved. Um, and so he started to build playhouses, which we were then able to donate to families. Um, and I think, you know, that sparked something. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the things I think we all need to be able to remind everyone is don't worry if you can't write a check, um, you know, a couple hours, four hours, whatever you have in your schedule to do it. I promise you're going to receive more than you give. And I love that about Habitat for Humanity. Everyone has an opportunity to give in this organization and make an unbelievably dynamic impact. Well, and I think that this, this focus on education really resonates with me. I think I've, I've shared with some of you and you, my father died when I was 20, when he was 27 and my mom had to recover. She was obviously a single mother at that point raising me. And it was that stability of home uh, that gave her the ability to go on and get her master's degree. And I think you see that resonate in Benita's story, and there's there are more many more like her, and so I think when you when you hear these stories and you think about the impact, um, maybe even on your your own family, um, back to Kendra's point is is there's so many ways to engage um, in the whole in the habitat experience. Uh, and one of my favorite things is that I remember early in my career I loved to do all the the roofing which you would never find me on the, you know, in my own house up on the roof trying to install it. 
I love the, the circle saw. <laughs> That's my favorite one, Nikki. I love doing the circle saw. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like power tools and it's okay. Um, and there's great volunteers that, that will teach you how to, how to use those. And, um, and honestly, you know, and Kendra's found this too. So it's Keegan is once you get involved, you can't help but to, to give, um, not only of your time, but of, of your resources. It just, it just happens. Um, so it's, it's just a great opportunity for women to get involved in this. Yeah, and I think as we recognize that, you know, affordable housing is, is critically about housing, making those other connections to things like education, um, especially as a, as, a, as a space of opportunity is so important, right? When we think about schools and we think about educational attainment um, and we think about some of the data that, that Heather gave and we think, you know, including the children of homeowners outperform children in, in math and science um, relative to families who rent, um, that they have fewer behavioral health issues, um, then we really began to understand that housing has kind of this bi-directional relationship with, um, with, our, with our achievement um, and our ability to access those spaces of opportunity, whether we're children uh, going to school or even adults going, going to school or going to work for that matter, right? Um, these give us the, the resources uh, to, um, to afford housing, um, but, but also having housing um, means that we can access those spaces. But you know, as as leaders in the community or 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 whomever we are, I think thinking about investment very broadly, as was suggested, is so important, right? Thinking not just about investing our money, but our time and our energy, um, because we tend, I think, to support investment in in you know, maybe construction or, or roads or public transportation or buildings, but we don't always think about investing in each other. Um, and so I think that one opportunity for, particularly for people in, in positions of leadership is to, to stop asking what it costs to do better and instead ask what it costs to not do better. Um, so in, investment in so many ways. Said. So, so sometimes people get confused with Habitat and they think that we give homes away. Um, <laughs> But that's a myth. The families partner and they put in at least 300 hours working on their home and on their neighbor's home. So they're truly building this community. And you, know, you hear stories about families that talk about what they did on someone else's home. Um, and then they also pay an affordable mortgage um, once the home is uh, available for them to move into. So I just wondered, for those of you that have been involved in builds, are there any particular stories from, or any particular families that really, um, that you have any stories from that, that really made an impact on you or on your team? Well, the Flores family. <laughs> I mean, that women's build, um, I mean, it was, it was very special to me that we were able to build a home for a single mom uh, and to just uh, un understand the impact of what that meant for her and how proud. Um, I think that's, you know, having your, your pride of being able to provide something for your family. And she truly did. Uh, and she worked really hard for it. it. It wasn't just given to her. And she got to this place uh, and she continues to thrive, uh, not just survive anymore. And I think for all of us at Kendra Scott that we're, we're able to get to know the Flores family and get to be involved in that build, uh, it touched us so, so deeply. And, you know, we're so excited that we're getting to do another women's build in 2021 uh, because, you know, we, we just, it's just such a special feeling. And then just to see the joy in the children um, and how happy they are to be able to go into their new home and um, how, again, proud, and I, I, I use that word because having self-pride, I think for a lot of times, you know, and I know this, uh, you can feel um, that you're not doing enough, you're not giving enough, you're not providing enough. And when you can see a mother or a parent who really has been trying so hard to get to that point where she has done something, a dream that she has been able to achieve and to see the pride in her eyes uh, for us and for me and for my team, it's something I'll never forget and, and can't wait to be able to, to do again. 
Well, and Heather, I'll just add, you know, I've, I've worked on a number of different builds over the years. And so what I would say is there's a, there's a, a, a line that follows through all families, whether it's in uh, the Rio Grande Valley, whether it's in San Antonio, whether it's in Amarillo, whether it's in Nashville, um, the families have been just so amazing in their uh, work ethic and their commitment to the build. So I've often found families who will put in extra hours or uh, work on their neighbors, their neighbor's house, um, and not just to, to make up hours, but to put in extra hours because they really want to build that, that community. And oftentimes these, these families, they come from, from all different places. And I think that that's what makes the Habitat neighborhoods um, so beautiful because these families um, bring um, all of their backgrounds and, and make and create that community and neighborhood. And we're just happy that we've got to work alongside them in the process. Well, Kendra, you mentioned 2021, which is my favorite topic now. I love <laughs> looking ahead, like, let's get to 2021, everyone, right? Ooh, I think we all are, right? <laughs> um, so just looking forward, I'd love to hear any um, you know, insights that you have into I mean, Kendra, you are obviously a very philanthropic company and organization. Um, obviously, you're building that into your personal life and your family when you talk about your son. I mean, what are, what are everyone's plans for 2021, uh, whether it has to do with Habitat for Humanity or affordable housing or any of these sectors that we talked about, safety, education, health? Can we, first, I'm going to take a nap on January 2nd. <laughs> No, um, and and maybe and maybe have a glass of rosé. No, we'll see. No, I, I, uh, in all, in all seriousness, I think we have gone through a tremendous year. Uh, everyone has, and the effects of of a global pandemic, the effects of uh, racial injustice in our country, the effects of of so many of things. Right. I think for me, I'm, I'm really focused a lot on mental health. Uh, and well-being. I uh, have seen the suicide rates uh, climbing uh, to a, a, a rate that has just absolutely overwhelmed us. And so as a company, I think we're really focusing, I mean, we always look at the, the health, uh, the, the em empowering uh, and education of women and children. But right now it is a, it, it is a, a, I think there's a big mental health area for that. Um, and what I love about Habitat is I do think that is providing a part of that safety is helping people feel like they have home. And, and so I think for us as a company, we really are looking at that. I mean, 40% uh, of, of teenage deaths right now is suicide. Um, and so giving stability to, to homes and, and trying to help uh, our youth and help those families. I think coming out of this year, as they've gone and lost their jobs, and uh, it's just it's a it's a it was a big year, and and I think it has affected all of us uh, mentally. I don't think anybody could say that that we are not all uh, you know are on our best, right? And it's okay to not be okay, and then to be able to have uh, you know support and support of other leaders within the in the community do everything we can to help get them out of that darkness bring light back into their life and joy uh, and that i think at kendra scott is really what we're trying to focus on is is we want to be uh, any way we can get into communities and bring joy light community show people that hold hands uh let's all hold hands together and let's uh, you know, work together. And like you said, with, you know, uh, Nikki, with Habitat, it is that idea of helping your neighbor, being there for one each other, lifting each other up. That really is our focus for 2021. Keegan or Nikki? Well, one of the things that I'm um, looking most forward to is back in June, uh, Bank of America announced a $1 billion commitment to uh, racial equity and economic opportunities. So much of that work is going to be around um, access to capital, um, housing, and education. So all the things that we've talked about today. So we're really digging deep. We're really talking to communities across the country and applying resources to bridge the gaps. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to continuing that work. It's a four-year commitment. So 
um, this work will go on, but I'm really looking forward uh, to, to that work. Uh, we also just launched a, a $5 billion uh, commitment to helping people uh, purchase homes. And so we just launched that uh, a few weeks ago. And so these are the types of initiatives that I'm looking forward to working with my team and our community partners um, to make sure that folks um, have access um, to these type of, of products and services that will help them um, achieve the dream of home ownership or a new uh, small business or to further their education. Yeah, there's a, a graphic um, that is so often used to distinguish equality from equity. Um, and, and, and you may have seen it. Um, it's, um, there's different versions of it, but one of my, one of my favorite versions um, has folks looking at a soccer game, three, three different people of different heights. And, um, and it talks about equality in the sense of what if we give everybody the exact same kind of boost, the, the, the exact same box under their feet, quite literally, so that they're tall enough to see over the fence to see the game. Um, and the, the equity version gives them different heights of boxes so that the shortest person gets, um, gets three boxes and the, the person in the middle gets two and the, the other one just gets one. Um, but my favorite version of this takes it a step further and it says, what if we just took down the daggone fence, right? What if we just let everyone see? And so that kind of justice-minded lens that really asks us to look at, at structurally, what is going on? How are we either deliberately or inadvertently making it harder for, for women, for families uh, to live their best lives um, is, is a real passion of mine. And it's one that I look forward to carrying into 2021 um, and, um, and, and maybe coming up with some new ways to do some measurement, to talk about um, the way that, that structural determinants of health um, impact our overall lives. Well, we're in November, so Thanksgiving's around the corner. I'm very thankful to all of you um, for what you do um, for the business community and for the community at large, and especially around the the um, um, topic of affordable housing, because you can see the trickle down effect and how it really um, impacts the community in Central Texas. Um, I also know that we are all very fortunate and um, have a lot to be thankful for. Um, so kind of in conclusion, we're at the end of our program. Um, I'm gonna end with asking you what one word describes home to you, but before we get to that, is there anything that you want to leave our audience with today? Um, this conversation has been, been wonderful and I think very um, hopefully enlightening to our audience, but kind of a last, any last thoughts or comments? And then I'm going to ask you, what is the one word that describes home to you? Well, I'll jump in. I mean, I just can't think of a better organization than Habitat. Uh, for humanity to engage in. So for everyone who's watching today, please share this message, share with others the importance of the work that Austin Habitat is doing. Uh, they have innovative, innovative designs for their housing. They work so hard to, um, to obtain land that um, is, is near job hubs they're doing such important work that, and it's so critical that the um, Austin community, uh, as Kendra said, join hands um, and empower women. Vicki, I couldn't say it any better than that. Uh, I mean, I, I echo all of your sentiments. Uh, it's a phenomenal organization. And like I said, there's so many ways you can get involved. and. And literally, when people say every dollar counts, every dollar does count. And it's not just dollars, it's, you know, your time and, and giving an you know, hour of your time or something that you may be throwing away in the trash, all of those things, right? Like, I think that's such an important part, but it is, it is so impactful and it makes such a difference. So uh, completely agree, Nikki. Get involved and start and, and even just put your big toe in and I promise your whole body will be in before you know it. <laughs> Any parting words, Keegan? 
Um, yeah, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not sure I could, could say it better uh, than has been said by Nikki and Kendra. Um, I, and I love this notion of just start, right? Just start somewhere. Um, it doesn't have to be a grand gesture. And sometimes I think we tend to, we, we may hold ourselves back until that moment. Um, but this notion that, that we just start somewhere and whatever way we can that day. Um, and, Austin, and, and have it have it for humanity is certainly an organization well worth uh, that investment. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Now I'm going to go around the horn. What one word describes home to you? I'm going to start with you, Nikki. Warmth. Warmth. <laughs> I'm laughing because you stole my word. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> That's good. <laughs> all right, Keegan, we'll give you a second then. Kendra? <laughs> Love. Um, you know, being around the people um, that I, that I love, that love is what makes a house a home for me. I have to say that the reason that, that warmth is my word, and if you, if you ask my family, they would say this, I, that I use this word as often as, as love, I think, um, because to keep someone warm is, um, it's like, it's, it's, it's the purpose, not just of a house physically, like in terms of our temperature, but, but it is what we do when we, when we love each other and when we're taking care of each other. Um, so I'm, I'm still going to decline to come up with another word. <laughs> That's <laughs> Just well, me with Potico on this. <laughs> I like warmth too. That would have been my number two. <laughs> well, mine would be happiness. And so I wish all of you that have joined us today uh, warmth, love, and happiness. And please stay safe and healthy out there and um, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And thanks for all you do um, in supporting Austin Habitat for Humanity. Thank you. Thank